So folks, Jack is taking it internationally, looking at Donald Trump's schemes and scams and tricks and criminality on an international scale, looking at his golf course in Scotland, which has been hit by Smith in a secret surprise. And it has everything to do, guys, with what we've been seeing in the last few days. Because it's connected to brand new info for one of Trump's top cronies, brand new info from one of Trump's top lawyers, and critically, and this is where it comes in really, really directly, a new focus on the money, on the ways in which in his final days in office, Donald Trump used and abused his supporters' trust and the public purse to enrich himself and his companies even as he was pretending to fight for his supporters. And the role of Scotland, we'll get into that, is essential. But let's start with the recent news, because one of Trump's, Trump's uh, top guys just got taken down, convicted, and there's a real sense that the news that the, the GOJ learned from him plays a big role in this international globetrotting. Well, every person has a right uh, to refuse to incriminate themselves under the Constitution. And had Mr. Navarro felt that his testimony would implicate him criminally, he could have come in and pled the fifth like others did. He's not saying that. He's saying he did nothing wrong. He was talking to journalists, but he refused to give the evidence to the committee. Um, you know, you can't do that. Uh, you know, yeah. Others, uh, you know, we referred... Um, Mark Meadows for prosecution. I regret that the department did not prosecute him, although he did provide a very large amount of documents. Uh, but I, I do think this was an important prosecution, and it does let people know that, uh, you know, a subpoena isn't just a suggestion, it's a requirement. Yeah. When these uh, committee investigations work, and you've been in, involved in more than one, uh, they provide facts. Uh, those facts can then be used to legislate. They can be used for the public to understand what's going on. And uh, in, in cases, they can be used by prosecutors. Um, it's just not just me saying this. I think many legal experts have said that this bipartisan committee, of which you were a member, um, really did add to the factual record in a significant way, um, particularly what you just mentioned, wanting to hear from individuals about the months-long process, the multiple disparate plots, some of which may not have ever involved an insurrection, but if they involve fraud or fake electors, it may still be criminal. Um, wh what do you see now that the DOJ and the Jack Smith probe uh, and Georgia, which of course is completely separate jurisdictionally from you, uh, from your committee's work, um, seem to have gone down that road, following the evidence that as terrible as the insurrection was, and we just had the stiffest sentence for a, you know, for a militia leader this week, uh, it was necessary to both understand and potentially prosecute uh, those other plots. Well, we had a lot of information. We were stonewalled by some, uh, but we dug in and we got people around the uh, individuals who refused to testify. And we uh, outlined uh, a wide ranging, multifaceted plot to overturn the election with the then President Trump at the center of it. Now, since then, it looks like uh, the uh, Mr. Smith has found additional information that we couldn't get. So Navarro is one of Trump's top advisors, advising him on the economy and things like that. And that necessitates an international lens. I don't know if he was good at his job, but he's certainly not good at staying out of conviction because he's gone down. But there was a sense that the DOJ got some dirt out of him and the DOJ has really honed in. And this guy was ultimately convicted. The only other person was Bannon for not going to the J6 committee. But he was called in and forced to testify at the DOJ. And there you can't really get out of it. Like, you know, it's the penalties are even harsher. So they all pretty much had to bow to the DOJ in a way that some people didn't to the January 6th committee. And some people were punished and some people weren't. We remember Meadows. Uh, gave his gave his text, but refused to testify. Ultimately, wasn't punished. We remember Trump even was subpoenaed, but ultimately wasn't punished for not following up with his subpoena. But that's critical because this is new info. We because this is new info we didn't know existed. But it gets worse for Trump as they bring in more information about these tapes. These are tapes that we, of course, we've known about for a few days at least, but this is brand new info 
taking down Trump and again, expanding the scope of his criminality. Nearly 13 months, 13 since the FBI searched Donald Trump's Florida Beach Club for classified documents, today we got new insight into what led up to that search. NBC News has confirmed that in May of last year, Trump was warned by one of his lawyers, Evan Corcoran, that the FBI might very well search Mar-a-Lago if Trump didn't comply with a grand jury subpoena requesting the return of those classified documents. ABC News was first to report on a warning that Mr. Corcoran gave to Mr. Trump, which Corcoran documented via voice memos on his phone. According to those voice memos, which NBC News has not yet heard nor seen transcripts of, but through a source familiar has confirmed the existence of, Mr. Corcoran explained to Mr. Trump, if you don't comply with the grand jury subpoena, you could be held in contempt. And there is a prospect that they, as in the government, could go to a judge and get a search warrant and that they could arrive here. That is here, as in Mar-a-Lago. In other words, these recordings appear to show that Mr. Trump was very well aware that a search of Mar-a-Lago was likely, which was not at all evident from Trump's statements the week after that FBI search when he sort of whipped up anger and indignation at law enforcement on Truth Social. There is no way to justify the unannounced raid of Mar-a-Lago without notification or warning an army of agents broke into Mar-a-Lago, went into the same storage area and ripped open the lock that they had asked to be installed. A surprise attack, politics, and all the while our country is going to hell. Remember when your lawyer told you that might happen? Anyway, also today, we finally got some insight as to why Trump's lawyers didn't take a tougher stance with their client. According to the recordings, Corcoran met with another lawyer who warned that Trump was just going to go ballistic if Corcoran pushed the former president to comply with that subpoena. In the end, Trump did not comply, and the rest is history. Joining me now is Mary McCord, former assistant U.S. attorney in Washington, D.C., and former acting assistant attorney general for national security at the DOJ. She is also, of course, a co-host of the invaluable MSNBC podcast, Prosecuting Donald Trump. Mary, thanks for helping me understand what's happening here. Um, these voice memos, the Trump campaign is saying, this is part of attorney-client privilege. You have no right to this. Um, is that fair? And how useful are these in the case that Jack Smith is making? Well, I think it's important to remember that these voice memos are were the subject of a dispute that was litigated in the District of Columbia, the District Court for the District of Columbia, back when Evan Corcoran, Mr. Trump's lawyer, of course, uh, during some of the Mar-a-Lago incidents, the one you were just re referring to in the opening, when the uh, Jack Smith and the grand jury sought to subpoena Mr. Corcoran to testify. He asserted attorney-client privilege, uh, not only over his testimony, but also over documents and things like that. The government took that matter to the chief judge of the district court in the District of Columbia and argued that the attorney-client privilege should be pierced because there was evidence to suggest that Mr. Trump was actually um, perpetrating a fraud on his own attorney. He was actually trying to use his attorney to commit a crime. The District of Columbia judge agreed with that, and that is why Mr. Corcoran then did testify in front of the grand jury and did supply these voice memos, which uh, at least some of which were seen by the grand jury because parts of these same voice memos appear in the indictment. This shows that he understood the role of his presidential powers. And that includes what he knew about presidential records, but also raising money and spending money and accepting money when he was president. These two things are intimately connected. And what this demonstrates is that his own personal lawyer, after he was out of office, was telling him repeatedly, you are willfully misunderstanding and misconstruing and distorting the Presidential Records Act. And if you continue to do this, you will be punished. But it also connects to the fact that he was being told these things and other things by White House lawyers in his final days as well, who were giving him much the same advice about what his powers were and were not. And he was given constant advice about what his rights under the PRA were and what about what his rights to the documents were when he was president, which even when he was president, his rights were not total and without question. He still had to follow procedures. Now, of course, as president, he had the power of declassification and all of that, but it wasn't automatic and, you know, it wasn't something that he could just do willy nilly in many cases. Right. And that applies to the finances as well. But I want you to listen to this because it really highlights 
how Jack in recent days has been taking a look at the money. And this takes us from the White House to Trump's golf courses and properties here to those abroad. Systems in Coffee County, Georgia. A voting machine breach in that county, Coffee County, Georgia, the day after the January 6th attack, forms the basis for multiple charges in Fonnie Willis's sprawling racketeering case. The federal level, Jack Smith also appears to be looking into Sidney Powell's role in spreading the big lie, specifically conspiracies about Dominion voting systems that, you will recall, led to Fox News having to pay Dominion up to three quarters of a billion dollars. CNN also reports that former NYPD Commissioner Bernie Carrick and another witness were, quote, both asked if Sidney Powell was ever able to back up her various claims of fraud, including conspiracy theories that foreign countries had hacked voting equipment. Both were also asked about defending the republic and how it was used as a source of funding efforts to find evidence of voter fraud. Jack Smith's investigation zeroing in on the big grift and voting machine breaches and the potential ties between the two is where we begin today. Former lead investigator for the January 6th Select Committee, Tim Hafey, is here. Plus, former U.S. Senator and MSNBC political analyst, our friend Claire McCaskill, is here. And former congressman from Florida and MSNBC political analyst, our friend David Jolly, is here. Tim Hafey, what is Jack Smith looking for? He's looking, Nicole, for more evidence of the big grift. We laid this out in, out in great detail during one or more of our hearings, and it's outlined in the report. A lot of people were profiting on this false narrative that the election was stolen. The Save America PAC, controlled by the former president, raised a $250 million after the election by telling people that the election was stolen. Sidney Powell set up a nonprofit and a legal defense fund in which those same lies led to a lot of people giving money. Again, it's important to remember that there's just no foundation in any of those fundraising solicitations. So Jack Smith is understandably interested in that because it could be a fraud scheme, right? Telling people uh, as a basis to raise money that facts that are just simply uh, not appropriate. And it's so you can see, right, one of the questions is, and we've talked about this, if Donald Trump was raising money in the final days and making money in the final days by siphoning it off to his golf courses and to his properties that he was making instead of spending it on these legal funds, holding events that were nothing to do with it, banquets, rallies, whatever, and then charging rent at his properties, that could be construed as wire fraud. And it could be construed as Trump understanding a criminal intent behind raising this money around the big lie, stop the steal, all of that right? Uh, you know, raising millions. Really, he raised a lot of money. Uh, he burned through most of it by now, but he's raised a lot of money in those final days of his presidency, supposedly to fight for the election, but he didn't spend nearly any significant portion, if anything, on that. And this is where Scotland comes in, because Jack is now looking at what we've been kind of talking about in the last little bit. And he's gone there to really hammer in, because there's multiple instances of the emoluments clause, being violated by Donald Trump, showing he has a knowledge of presidential powers. And if you can say he's knowingly violated the emoluments clause, then you could say he has no excuse to not knowingly violate the PRA and other laws. And what this demonstrates is that Donald Trump's golf course accepted subsidies and, and, and gifts and all of these things when he was president, including very recently accepting money during the pandemic to stay open. But that likely violates the emoluments clause because it's them accepting money as a, as a family, Trump family-owned business, not in a blind trust. Remember, they didn't put it in a blind trust like they were told to or sell off like they were told to directly accepting money from a foreign government. In this case, the United Kingdom, the very country that the United States rebelled against to establish its freedom. And Trump is taking payments from the country that once colonized and entrapped the United States, right? It's, it's heinous stuff. So there we are. Jack is taking it international and on a moment too soon.